Hello, welcome to my course on literary theory. I'm Masood Raja, and in this brief lecture, I'll, I would like to introduce you to two major concepts in new criticism, intentional fallacy and affective fallacy. Now, both of these concepts were discussed by several critics, but were made prominent within the new critical movement by W.K. Wimsett and Beardsley. Now, I've included the handout with this lecture, which I encourage you to read. And don't be intimidated by it, because uh, they do cite other people. So like any other academic work, they are trying to locate their discussion within the discussions about literary studies before them and where it must be headed. Uh, now, I will cut to a brief screen reading of the one part of the text and then come back to you, you know, with more information. So here we go. Let's say this is one of the canonical essays in New Criticism and by Wimsett and Beardsley. This is what they are trying to do. It's, and I'll read, the claim of the author's intention upon the critic's judgment has been challenged in a number of recent discussions notably in the debates entitled The Personal Heresy between Professors Lewis and Tilliard. So read the footnote here. These are two scholars. And at least imp implicitly in the periodical essays like those in the symposiums of 1940s, in the Southern and Kenyan reviews. But it seems doubtful if this claimed and most of its romantic corollaries are yet subject to any widespread questioning. Right? And then they go on to tell us that they, both of them, had written a dictionary entry on the intentional fallacy. And then this essay is kind of building up on that. What is intentional fallacy, the ten different ways that it is defined, and why must the critic not make the mistake of trying to read the outside intention of the author while reading it. And that's the important point here. We argued that the design or intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of literary art. And it seems to us that this is a principle which goes deep into some differences in the history of critical attitudes. So I'll briefly explain this essay now, but don't be intimidated by all the references that they are making. That is how a scholarly article is written. So I'm going to pause this uh, screen recording of the text itself, which I hope you will read, and come back to you face to face, and then explain uh, this whole project further. OK, so as you saw, they are first giving us an account of their own work on intentional fallacy. And they openly declare that the authorial intention is not significant in reading a literary text. So what do they mean? What they are trying to say as you read the essay is that some critics believe that a poem needs to be judged by two, let's say, parameters. One whether the poem has its own value or not, and two, whether the poem has arrived at the poet's announced intention. And if it has, then it is a good poem. What they're trying to say is that we don't need to know what the poet, poet had intended to write, because the poem itself is the arrived intention of the author. And you can understand that arrival of intention through phenomenology, right? And phenomenology is a field of study which studies phenomena, but which also teaches us that we intend the reality that's in front of us. How do we do that? By bracketing everything else that's not significant at a certain moment. So by discussing the intentional fallacy and the affective fallacy, what Wimsett and Beardsley are trying to teach us as new critics is that in the process of reading, we cannot bring in any autobiographical information about the author or what the author might have even said about a poem or a work. 
all we must read is the text itself. When we bring something from author's life or from outside of the poem, we are bringing the intention of the poet and the author into an act of reading, and that is what they call the intentional fallacy, right? The affective fallacy, affect is feelings, right? What some text makes us feel. How many of you and me and everyone else always tell others, hey, this poem made me sad, this poem made me happy. Affective fallacy is when the reader brings in his or her experience in the act of reading by suggesting as to what the poem did to them. How did it make them feel? Did it make them sad? So these two critics are then telling us that an act of reading a poem within the new critical tradition should not look for authorial intention, should not bring any evidence from outside. You know, Eliot was having a nervous breakdown when he wrote The Wasteland, so hence the poem is like that. No. Poem itself is its own evidence, right? And two, we can't bring to an act of critical reading what the poem does to us, what the poem makes us feel, because that is effective fallacy. Bringing in the authorial intention is the intentional fallacy. So these are the two concepts that are discussed in this essay. Now, I've only included the part on intentional fallacy because that's crucial. But whenever someone asks you what are the two main criteria other than what we've already read about new criticism, you can always point out that intentional fallacy, reading the instant, bringing in the intention of the author from outside the poem or a text, and affective fallacy, bringing in your own feelings and emotions, what the poem invokes in you, are two big things not to do in new criticism. Now, as I said, the resources has the full text of the intentional fallacy, and I'll see if I can also link to it. Please download it, read it carefully, and then listen to this lecture, because this lecture is just supposed to augment your understanding of the reading. Thank you so much, and if you have any questions, please send them my way, and I'll be happy to address them. Thank you, and see you next time.